Part 4. Let's have a look at variables, single quotes versus double quotes, dollar zero, dollar dollar, dollar bang, screen, change mod and change owner. Each of these will help us to be a lot more powerful with using Bash and Linux. OK, let's start with variables. A very straightforward example is export v1 is variable 1. And we could say echo v1. If we want to be properly ensuring that our variables are encapsulated, we could use little brackets. The reason why this is handy is let's do something like this. There's no output. However, if we properly encapsulate it, there's output because now we've shown bash, okay, this part is a variable, this is not. Straightforward and easy. Within scripts, we will often do something like set the variable without using export. Now let's have a look at single quotes versus double quotes. If we have the same with a single quote it will just output it as straight text. Single quotes means don't interpret whatever is in between them as a variable. It's all just text. If we use double quotes then it will interpret variables. So we could say this and we could say this. And as you can see it's interpreted as variables. There are of course a number of environment variables and we can call those uh, to the screen by using the set command. We can all see all sorts of interesting things like our username which can also be displayed by who am I, um, what sort of terminal we're using, what sort of um, client, IP address we're using, etc, etc, etc. Let's clear the screen. There are also a number of shorthand variables. OK, so S0 or dollar um, sign zero tells us what is currently running. Let's make a test script and notice that it's probably a good idea to specify that any scripts are um, have a suffix of dot sh, a shell script. OK, so here we've got a script ready and in it we're going to display what is currently running, which should be the script name. We're going to sleep and notice the ampersand here and I want to show you what this does. Let's say we say sleep one. Okay, so it slept for one second and then the client prompt came back. Sleep three. It slept for three seconds and the client prompt came back. How about if we sleep for three seconds, but we do so in the background? And the background is what this command is showing here. Please don't confuse it with what we saw in the previous section where we were redirecting the output to the, sta the standard error output to the standard out output. This ampersand is completely unrelated to the ampersand we're going to use here. In this case, the ampersand at the end shows that we want to run this command in the background. It's assigned to the background, the prompt comes back straight away. Now this process has run in the background and by now it's finished. We don't see the finished output straight away but if we hit enter, ah, there it is. So our background process is finished. How about if we start a process in the background? Let's make it a bit longer, 15 seconds and it's running in the background. There we go, it's still running. Now I say FG, which means foreground. And now we've brought this background process back to the foreground. And we now have to wait until it finishes. These are some handy ways of working with background processes. Very light introduction to this at the moment. 
So let us go back to our test script and have a look what's there. So we're outputting again what's currently running, which would be test.sh. We're going to sleep for 10 seconds in the background and we're going to echo something else here. Now the dollar bang, what this indicates is it will output the process identifier of this particular process running in the background. Let's see how this works. So here's the file for reference and let's run it. Notice that if we want to run something I specify run me from the current path. Okay, so here's our dollar zero output and a little bit later our dollar bang output, the process ID. Let's sleep for 120 seconds or 2 minutes. Let's start this process. Now I might go ahead and kill this particular process. Kill minus 9 is very destructive, it will make sure that it's killed. Okay, so now this process was running in the background and we've killed it. Let's confirm that it's indeed gone. And then here we are introducing a few new commands again. We're requesting a all-in process list and we're going to grab for the sleep binary. Now what we're seeing here is simply our grab. We're grabbing for sleep. So this grab is also a process which is running and we can confirm because it's not the same process ID. It's just a little bit further on which makes sense. And its output is simply the grab. To make this a bit more clear we could exclude this output and indeed our sleep is gone. If we start a new sleep in the background and we confirm, sure enough, there's our sleep running in the background. And again, we could go ahead and kill the process. And we can see here a confirmation that it's killed. Why do we get the confirmation here and not here? It's simply because here it's running in a different shell. Here it's running in this shell, so we get the output and indeed our process is no longer there. So we've seen quite a number of things here. We've seen dollar zero, which is what is currently running. We've seen the last started background process identifier. And if you will remember this is the last one we started, and look, it matches. Also, what we can use is dollar dollar. What this will show is the current process PID. So, in other words, if I were to kill, let me not do this because it would exit my client, let's start a new shell session, and I can do this simply by saying sh. Let's check what the process ID of this shell is and we're going to self-kill our own cell session and indeed we killed ourselves and we're back here at the command prompt. Killed ourselves figuratively speaking of course. I wouldn't want you to do it the other way. <laughs> now Let's have a look where especially this command may come in very handy. We clear our screen and we're going to introduce here screen. Screen is a very handy command that uh, shows just another screen. That was confusing. Let's see how that worked. Exit. Uh huh. Screen is terminating. It's like another session, but within the same shell session. Let's try again. Screen. Exit. So we've gone from one into another, and then we've exited back out. Okay. 
So now that we're in the screen session, let's have a look. Notice that we're specifying minus ls, which is very similar to the ls command. We're listing all the screen sessions. Ah, uh, there are three screen sessions on the server active at the moment. And there's one that's attached. That's the one we're working in. Now, when we have many screen sessions open, if we check the current process ID with dollar dollar, then the current process ID will be one off from the process ID of the screen session itself. So in this case, you know, 580 and 579. 579 is the one that's attached, and in this case it's all very easy to see. However, if you have a list of 10 or 20 screen sessions, and numbers of them are attached because you have numerous uh, sh uh, SSH sessions open in various uh, terminal windows, and uh, a number of them show attached, then it's hard to figure out which one you're exactly dealing with. So, in that case, you can use echo dollar dollar and it will tell you the process ID, which is very handy when compared with the list as outputted by screen minus ls. So, let's be a little bit tricky and delete or kill our current process ID. Screen terminates and it's gone. Great. Let's go back into screen. And how can we get out of screen while leaving it live? Actually, I should write it like this. We press and hold down control. We press A and we press D. And we have now detached. Let's have a look. Here we can see the number, so it's very easy to identify which one it is we should connect to. Let's go back in there. We detach any screens that are attached, not at the moment, so this is a little bit overboard, but let's leave it in there. And we reattach to this particular one. Now notice that I don't need to type, um, actually I can only type two, as long as it identifies exactly which PID that we're connecting to, which process ID we're connecting to, I can simply use a shortcut. So we're back in our session. We're attached. Now let's remember this process ID of the cell session, which is running inside this screen session. Control A and Control D. I've disconnected. I'm going to kill that process. And it's gone. Now sometimes when you're running something else within a screen session that is going a bit haywire, for example, very intense QA testing, what you might see is here killed. In that case, I believe it's killed, it might also have a different terminology. In any case, what we can do then is we can call screen minus wipe and it would wipe any screens are in the guilt state. Okay. Now, we have this test script here. Let's remove it and let's make another one. Something very simple. Now, if we try and run this like this, it will not work. Permission denied. Why is this? Remember how we have world, group, and user privileges. And we can notice that there's three different types. Read, write, and execute. Read, write, and execute. So, in this particular case, we can see that the execute flag, if you will, is missing completely. So, we say add the execute flag to test. Now the execute flag was added everywhere. And notice how the color changed too. And we can execute the script. Very straightforward. There's a lot more to chmod. I recommend that you have a look at the manual. And just browse through. And there's also something like change owner. 
change owner allows us to change the owner of a file. Let's introduce two more commands sudo and su. sudo and su are two commands that allow us to go into super user mode. Let's say that we go into super mo user mode like this. Okay, we've jumped into root. Also our prompt has changed and we are still in the same directory but now let's make another file now we have a file that's created by root very interesting how about if we say change me the owner of test2 to the group rule and the user rule. Let's have a look. Sure enough it was changed. And we can change the owner to the group root and to the user root for test. And indeed we have changed. So now we were in SU mode, we will exit out of it and we're back into normal user mode. What's the difference with sudo? Well, let's try and change a file to root again. See if it will allow us to do this. Yes, it has. sudo has been set up on this machine so that it doesn't require uh, any uh, password when the user rule is working. For those of you that uh, would be interested in changing those sort of things, you can use Visudo which brings you into the configuration of uh, of course run it with root privileges which brings you into the configuration and you can uh, set this up in this case it's very straightforward how it's set up just a little tidbit for those of you who have a little bit more experience with system management so what is the difference between sudo and su? Well, first of all, you can see how sudo can be used for one-line commands. Very straightforward, very easy, we don't have to type a user password if we set it up with the sudo. Um, very straightforward. Now, there's another benefit to sudo, and that is you can grant somebody sudo privileges and make sure that everything that is executed for the sudo is logged. Versus su really brings you into a uh, um, high-level super user run mode shell uh, from where you can do pretty much everything. The privileges might be very similar to sudo but with su the logging would be configured in a different way. So we can even do things like sudo su and this time I don't need to enter a password because the privilege was granted by sudo to execute su already. All this can be explored in more detail if necessary. Okay, that's it for this for this part. I hope to see you in the next.